the contribution of women in South Africa's liberation came in many different forms. American-born visual artist Judy Seidman used art as a powerful weapon in the fight for democracy. Some might say art runs deep through her veins. Her grandmother, Anita Wilcox, was pegged as one of New York's leading illustrators in the 1920s and 30s. Seidman cites a banner in protest against the Korean War as her first political art piece. She was six years old at the time. Judy's life is marked by constant change. The family left the United States for Ghana in the early 1960s when her father accepted a teaching position at a university in that country. While at boarding school, Seidman crossed paths with leading Ghanaian visual artist Kofi Antobam, who she credits for her first real artistic awakening. After obtaining her master's in fine arts from the University of Wisconsin, Seidman returned to Africa joining her parents in Zambia in 1973. It was here where the artist first encountered the African National Congress and made friends with Thabo Mbeki, Max Sisulu and others. Seidman was enthralled by the sights and the sounds of the markets and streets of Lusaka and for the first time realized the power of art in breaking cultural boundaries. In 1980, by that time a young mother, Seidman seeked out the Medu Art Ensemble, a group of cultural workers who were exiled from South Africa and living in Khabarone. The collective was established in 1977 and included well-known names like poet Wally Sorote, artist Tammy Mignele, musicians Jonas Gwangwa, Hugh Masakele and others. By 1982, the apartheid regime routinely assassinated activists in neighboring countries. Medu became a target and was put under pressure by the government of Botswana to tone down the political messaging in its posters. The collective, however, continued to create strong, unsigned images portraying the armed struggle, slipping posters into South Africa, sticking them up on walls and in offices in the dead of night. The posters created by Medu became a strong symbol of the struggle and a powerful tool in the fight for liberation. Seidman was strongly influenced by fellow artist Tami Mnyele, who was shot and killed by the South African Defence Force outside his home in Khabarone in 1985. The year before, in 1984, Mnyele designed the logo for the African National Congress an image that is still used today as a symbol of the fight for a non-racial society. Judy, you've had an incredible journey all the way from the States here to South Africa with a couple of stops on the way. I want to talk about your, your activism and how you got involved with the liberation movement. My first contact with the ANC actually was in Lusaka in 1972. I had just finished university. I went to university in the States. My parents were teaching at the University of Zambia, so I went to visit them. It was supposed to be for a couple of weeks. That didn't work out. <laughs> but my younger sister got a job as a 17-year-old working as a secretary in the ANC office in Lusaka. After I decided to stay with my parents at that point, and about six months later, I had an exhibition at uh, the public library, actually, in Zambia, because there weren't any galleries. And some of Neva's friends from the office came and helped me set it up. And uh, they drove this Russian car called the Gaz, which we took the pictures from the house to set it up. And a couple of days later, the person who drove the, the gas was a young man named, uh, his work name was J.D. for John Dubé, and his real name was Boy Mvuyer, I think. 
was killed in a letter bomb that arrived at the desk that my sister Neva should have been at, but she was home for lunch that day. So my first work for the ANC was actually designing a poster for J.D.'s death. And I swear, obviously you knew about them before, but what an introduction into starting your, your life with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us more about your art and what grew from this relationship with the ANC. I'd always been interested in art as a expression of how you see society, how you see the world around you. When I was in secondary school in Ghana, my art teacher was a Ghanaian artist called Kofi Antabam, who was one of the key cultural people involved in the Pan-Africanist movement. And while I'm sure he had no use whatsoever for me as a <laughs> 12 or 13 year old <laughs> at that time, um, I was certainly very interested in how he would talk about and explain the issues around African culture and how that reflected the art that people lived with and how it was not really effectively brought into the international world at that stage, mm -hmm. for sure. I was also very interested in apartheid and South Africa politics from boarding school. The boarding school I went to in Ghana was a school called Achimata. <laughs> and I don't want to say there were race issues in the school. There were exactly three whites in the school. That was my brother, my sister, and me at nice. the time I was there. And it was a boarding school. And, of course, I spoke English, and I did not speak any of the Ghanaian languages. Everybody hates their boarding school. I certainly hated mine. <laughs> um, but clearly the explanations about what was happening, about race and culture and all of that, were fundamental to how I saw myself. Mm. And probably how I survived was trying to think about those things. Okay, so and are you so, saying that, that these sort of experiences also just so informed your expression through so art? So I started to, to, to think about how those things created people's life, formed people's lives, if mm. you like. In terms of South Africa, one of the things that was actually quite important for me was the school library got copies of Drum Magazine. Mm. In 1963, we were getting all of those photographs of the treason trial and so on. And I used to spend hours in the library reading through the reports of the treason trial and those early photographs mm. um, from the trial. It just seemed to me that a society that had so much trouble around race and had so incorporated it to the issues of law and, and living, maybe made it more explicit than it was in the situation I was in. And did you ever feel that, you know, possibly knowing more out there than the majority of South Africans knew happening in their own country? Absolutely. Did that help drive your desire to tell the story? Absolutely. Um, one of the things I've always thought was that at the point when I was living in Swaziland and Botswana, we got the... The Weekend World, we got the, the okay, the Rand Daily Mail, and we also had, as a social group, mm. obviously mixed race and everything else. You, it wasn't even thought about, or except being so close to South Africa, it was thought about. I would never have been able to even read those things mm. if I lived in South Africa. Mm. And the first time I went to Johannesburg and discovered you couldn't actually get <laughs> get the Weekend World newspaper in central Johannesburg, unless you went down to Park Station at 6 o'clock in the morning when mm. people were coming off the trains. I know the blanket on information was pretty effective, it wasn't it? It just wasn't the same world. Mm. And then how did you get from there to Mkontwe Sizwe? What happened? And tell us more about your experience. Many of the people we knew in Busaka, obviously, through my sister's group and when I started doing drawings, um, I did do some drawing for the ANC there. The, I, most of the stuff I did for them after the, that first poster, which mm. was obviously somebody that I personally knew, yeah. that <laughs> was just a shock. I, I think it was the first violent death I had ever had to deal with. The next group of drawings I did was I was asked to do from the... There was a very strong women's group attached to the ANC, which included Gertrude Chope and with Mampati, uh, Ray Alexander. They had a magazine called Voice of Women. I did a couple of covers for that. 
and they asked me to do some drawings of leading South African women, which I did as charcoal drawings, which were then exhibited um, in the offices. And I think there was an exhibition somewhere else as well of those. The ones that I drew there would, would have been Helen Joseph and um, Lillian Ngoi and, in fact, Tenji and Tinso, which has a very funny follow-up because I'm, Tenji came to Botswana in 1985 and she actually became my commander at one stage yeah. for quite a long time. It would have been the senior commander, and I was, again, very low down in that structure. Yes. <laughs> but she was a senior. When I first met her, I looked at her. She was using a different name altogether. I thought, I know this person. Yeah. Where is this it again? And, you and wouldn't I put the said, two together. That's I said to some, an, another comrade, yeah, isn't that Tenji and Tinso? I did a drawing. There. I'm sure that's Tenji. Apparently, she got ragged about it. Endlessly, <laughs> because how can you possibly claim to be underground if people have been drawing pictures of you yes, 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 in yes, other countries? You know? <laughs> and what did you learn about women in the movement and in the controversies and um, the challenges facing women? Well, I would have said, well, f firstly, I should say, let me go back a little bit of a step. So after Lusaka, I got married, in fact, to a historian who specialized in Botswana. We got sent to the University of Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, and Botswana at that time. Mm -hmm. But Swaziland campus. Oh, yes. So we then spent five years at Swaziland. So that was at the time of the 76 uprising. I also had my first child at that stage. I was asked to teach, co-teach an art class at a school that was set up for refugees of, from 76. The original teacher there, the main teacher there, was Patika Ntuli. And so he and I had some exhibitions together, since he does sculpture and I do painting, that worked very well. And um, that was one of the artistic, artistically important. Of course, he was PAC, which politically, yes wasn't really a question we debated about, no. but he certainly was very, very much an inspiration in terms of his conception of how you use art to look at how people's aspirations and ideals. I get very nervous about people who, who speak about you know, aren't you asked to do political ideas? Yeah. Firstly, they're my political ideas. They're not things that people ask me to do. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, we discuss them, and yes, yeah. we discuss what's the best way to yeah. portray them. It's but you portrayal. would do that with, mm. it's, it, ultimately, it's my portrayal yeah. as part of a collective, perhaps. Yes. yes, And I don't think I've ever, with possibly one exception, I don't think I've ever been told you will not do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably what makes your images so strong. You know, I mean, there's something that you believe yeah, in. Yeah, no, but, but the gender thing. I, I am coming yeah. back to gender yeah. <laughs> and eventually to gender. It's like, are we allowed to, so, we allowed to so go around? So one of the questions that came up with all of this, and, and then after um, 1980, my, at, at that point, still husband, later ex-husband, mm -hmm. uh, got, got the job he always wanted in the University of Botswana. And so we went to Botswana, mm -hmm. and that's how I joined the group called Meru Art Ensemble, mm -hmm. and probably also the best-known work I've done as well. Meru was set up in Botswana in 1979, just before I got there, or a year or so before I got there. And it was a collective of South African exile, or mostly exile, um, artists, not just visual artists, but it also included musicians and writers. And Tumasa Keller at one stage was there. Dennis and Polly was led one of the bands in Meadow for a long time. Jonas Guanqua was in Meadow for many, many years. Poets included Wally Soroti and um, Raweli Hotsisile, the late. Do you think that's why it was targeted? Absolutely, <laughs> un un undoubtedly. <laughs> and it was very important in terms of changing people's perspectives, even in South Africa, mm. as to how you use art and what role it played in terms of expressing the culture of resistance, that's yeah. what we called it. Yeah. Um, so within Meru, there were relatively few women, mm. as with, in fact, most of the liberation movement I think in the camps they say between 1 in 10 and 1 in 15, depending on of, of the people in the camps were women. My ex-husband's house got petrol bombed. 
We're not quite sure why his place was petrol burned, and we're not sure whether they knew it was empty at the time. He had gone to a conference and the kids were staying with me. The petrol bomb hit the kids' room and burnt it out. If they had been there, they would not have survived. Mm -hmm.